Um, we've been talking about vector value functions, and then we talked about derivatives and integrals, and and then we started to talk about uh, some other stuff, and then I, I forgot to include this in our notes. So when you're taking derivatives, we follow the same dif der differentiation <coughs> rules when we do the component-wise differentiation. But when we look at the big picture and look at the vector themselves, uh, we have a handful of rules. Some of them are kind of obvious. Some of them are are are, uh, are not so obvious. But it's important to 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 bring this up and then have this as part of our discussion. And there's going to be a couple that we're going to use uh, this time. There's some that we kind of used last time also, but we didn't really talk much about it. So the, the derivative of uh, the sum or difference of two vectors is the sum or difference of the derivative of each of those vectors. This one we used last time. We have a, a scalar times a vector <coughs> uh, function, vector function. And then that that's like you know taking the scalar out and taking the derivative of the function itself. Uh, here, we have a scalar function f and a vector function u, and that follows the product rule. And keeping in mind that you actually have one of them as a scalar function, which just means it's like a t squared or something, then the other one's a vector function, which has components. So you have to treat them differently. And this is what we have for that part of that type of product rule. Uh, we also have two other products. One of them is a dot product and a cross product. Uh, the other two are dot and cross products. And they'll follow the same sort of product rule that we've had before, except you'll put a dot or a cross product, depending on what it is you're working on. And then uh, the last bit over here is uh, a chain rule. Uh, we have a vector function, and inside of the vector functions, the variable is changed into a function. Or inside of those vector functions, you have uh, a scalar function that's embedded in, in those component-wise functions. So you'll just use the, the chain rule, or something that looks like a chain rule. Okay, so this actually are some rules from back in 13.2 or something like that. And then we're, uh, we're currently talking about curvature. We talked about arc length and that idea is pretty easy. Uh, you got a formula to use and then a hard integral to, to punch into Wolfram Alpha. but um, the theoretical part of that's tricky in terms of arc length is to reparametrize your your um, reparametrize by arc length, reparametrize your parameterization by arc length. And what that does is it finds us a nice, steady, normal way to look at um, the curvature. And so we talked about that last time, and so now I just want to give you some more curvature formulas and try to get you some idea of what's what's important about the curvature. So let's take a look at the curvature. So uh, hold on. So the curvature has this definition. It's the rate of change of the unit tangent with respect to um, the arc length. And what that allows us to do is that it takes us away from the dependency on the parameterization and lets us focus on 
the geometry of the curve itself. Um, and so these are some of the formulas that we saw last time already. And I'm kind of interested in focusing on a two-dimensional graph um, because it's like the thing to look at. Um, and that's the, the parabola, to take a look at the curvature of a parabola. <coughs> now, the parabola is written as y is equal to x squared. Uh, so it's not quite written as a parameterized curve. Right, so let's take a look at using trying to use this formula from last time. <coughs> Which means we have to take our parabola y is equal to x squared and see if we can write that as a parameterized curve. And, and furthermore, we have to do a cross product, and cross products really work for three dimensional vectors, and so. Uh, when we take the cross of something two-dimensional, do you know what's going to happen? If we treat a two-dimensional vector as if it was a two-dimensional, a three-dimensional vector, then you're really just restricting this vector on the xy plane, right? Which means z is equal to zero. Or you can let, let z equal to anything you want, but usually we let z is equal to zero. All right, so that's our plan. So let's see if we can use this formula for finding the curvature of a parabola. Mm, new page. So our first step is to see if we can write this as a parameterized curve. And would you know how to write this as a parameterized curve? So instead of relying, looking at just the graph, uh, see if we can write this with a parameter, t. So a vector value function has components, right? And uh, what, what do we do? X equals t. So if you put x equals t, that'll get us going. This is moving along the x-axis so that you can let just t or your, let x be your parameter or pretend that that's your parameter and then let it go along. If it's one of those curves that, uh, that doesn't pass the vertical line test but it's a fun y, uh, x is a function of y, then you can let x or you can let t be your independent variable in that case. So if x is equal to t, then y is equal to t squared. And like I said, this is something that we need to take the cross product of, so we probably want to set it in three dimensions, which in that case we'll just let the, um, z equal to zero. Then we have a, a parabola on the xy plane. Okay. So according to the formula, we need like two derivatives or something, r and r prime. We're going to cross them, and then we're going to find the magnitude of r prime. So let's do that. Um, r prime of t. Uh, I think I started to do this in blue. So r prime of t is equal to 1 t squared and 0 and r double prime of t is equal to 0. Oops, this should be 2t, right? And let's take the cross product of that. r prime cross r double prime and if I cross this, it looks like it'll be, um, let's see, cross out the first column, 0 and 0. Cross out the second column, 0 and 0. By the way, when you, these two vectors are vectors in, in, uh, in the xy plane, so they only have an x and a y and a 0, which means they're lying flat, horizontal on the xy plane. If you cross two vectors lying flat on the xy plane, what do you get? What do you get when you cross two vectors? What? You get another vector, but what's special about that vector? 
it's perpendicular to the two vectors that you're crossing. So if these two vectors are on the xy plane, when you cross them, they're necessarily going to have to be going straight up. And if they're going straight up, then the x and the y components are zero. So we're, we're kind of at that point. So I thought I'd bring it up. And then the z component is just uh, when you cross out the z component, you get uh, two. <coughs> so we want the magnitude of that, which is just two. All right, uh, the denominator is the magnitude of the, the first derivative, right? So we'll take the magnitude of the first derivative. And that's equal to the square root of 1 plus 2t quantity squared. So not much I can do with that, I don't think. So I think I'll just leave it like that. Um, so the curvature is going to be given by 2 divided by square root of 1 plus 2t squared. Oh, is it? Yeah. I don't know my formula. Yep, it's cubed. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> All right. There you go. Okay. So this is our our. Um, that that was that was pretty easy, huh? So this is our curvature, which means uh, if we take a look at let's just take a look at a couple of points in the parabola. Oh, I think I wanted my answer in red. Not that it matters. I used to be a lot more color-minded, kind of be consistent with my colors and stuff, kind of not caring so much anymore. <laughs> not that I don't care about you guys. So let's try a couple of points over here. Maybe uh, zero is a nice point. When t is equal to 0, you're at this uh, origin point, the vertex. And when you put 0 in, you're going to get square root of 1 in the denominator, and so it's just equal to 2. So the curvature here is 2. Uh, what if we do something like uh, k of 1, or kappa? So if we put 1 in there, we're going to get uh, 2 over Not a nice number, but um, 5. So square root of 5 to the third power. Let's just call it 5 to the, what is it, 3 halves. I guess I'm more concerned. Is that going to be bigger than 2 or less than 2? It would be less than 2. So when t is equal to 1, you're here. And then it kind of makes sense. This is more curved. And the, looking at the parabola, this is more curved than this. As you get further and further out, it looks like the parabola is straightening out. So let's, let's exaggerate and take the curvature at some big, bigger number like 10. 2. And then if this is 10, oh boy, that just blew up, huh? 20. 400, 401. So let's let's get approximations for this. Like, what's the approximation for two divided by five over three halves? Let's get a numerical value there. Does that have your calculators with you? Your phones? Scientific calculators? Point 
0.178. Can we get a confirmation there? We good? All right. So let that one, <laughs> now let's put 401 in there. So 2 divided by 401 to the 5 halves. To the 5 halves, yeah. Is it 5 halves? 3 halves, sorry. Oh, that's still point zero 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 three. <coughs> so that does make sense. Looking at a parabola, as you get further and further out, it looks like it turns flatter and flatter, so there's not much curving going on there. So that, that makes sense. All right, there's a couple things I want to do. Uh, one, I want to see if we can generalize this into a formula for y is equal to f of x. And two, I, I want to look at the actual values of the curvature and see what they really mean with respect to the picture. So one, generalize. y is equal to f of x. So instead of looking at a specific y is equal to <coughs> x squared, what if we change everything into f of x? So if we change this into f of x, we'll change this to f of t. And then at prime, the derivative of t is still going to be 1, and the derivative of f of t now is f prime of t. Second derivative. The derivative of 1 is going to be 0. The derivative of f prime of t is f double prime of t. So on the numerator, when we're taking the cross product, when we take the cross product, we're going to get 0, 0, and 1 times f double prime. Right? So from your curvature here, We can put t or we can put x. Let's just jump the replace it with x. So with your curvature here, you're always going to get your 0, 0, your, your r prime cross r double prime is going to be 0, 0, f double prime of t. So this 2 actually was f double prime. And we want the magnitude of that. So we really want the magnitude of f double prime of it, t. In this case, we're replacing back into x. So your numerator becomes that. And your denominator is the magnitude of your r prime raised to the third power. And so if you take a look at the magnitude of r prime, it's just really equal to 1 plus f prime of x quantity squared, which is like the arc length, right? That's what goes into arc length. And then raise this to the third power. I hope that's right. Mm, well, they wrote it a little bit differently, but yeah. So if we have that function, uh, uh, y is a function of x instead of a parameterized function, we can rewrite our curvature formula. And this might have been, this might have been a formula that, could have been done in calc 1 or calc 2 because it's really just dealing with derivatives. There's no cross products here, no nothing like that. So um, this is your formula for the curvature. If you have y as a function of x. Okay. All right, so that's the one thing I wanted to go over. The next thing I wanted to go over is the, the numerical value of the curvature itself. So for the numerical value of the curvature itself, what might be interesting to look at is what does that mean? What, what's that number give you? I mean, it gives you a number. We know that if it's a large number, then it's really curvy. And if it's a small number, then it's really kind of flat, almost like a line. In fact, you can check that if you have a line, 
then your curvature is going to be zero because it just doesn't curve at all. So you can put a linear function in here, you'll see that that's going to work. That's exactly what's going to happen. <coughs> but uh, is there something more significant to that number? So it turns out that the number that you get for your curvature is related to a, a circle. Um, and we'll call it a, a tangent circle. What? It's kind of interesting. No. So yeah, power series, you got these tangent polynomials and stuff like that. Uh, but for, for, uh, for the curvature, it's, um, it's actually a circle. So let's, let's, before we do the parabola, let's do a, a generic curve kind of like the one that we tried to do last time. And if we take a look at a couple of points here that would have significantly different curvatures, uh, let's imagine what a tangent circle might look like. So a tangent circle would be a circle that would be tangent to this curve at that particular point, right? All right, something like that. Now, we know that for this first point over here that we get a k that's kind of small. And for this point over here, because it's really curvy, we get a k that's kind of large. By k, I mean kappa. All right, but it looks like the circle is doing something different for a small K, we got a large circle. For a large K, we got a small circle. So what do you think would have that sort of property where you can relate the circle and the curvature? I don't know if I'm asking the right question here. Read my mind. So some sort of ratio probably, right? Because we're looking at the radius of a circle and maybe, I guess the better question is how, does the, how do you think the radius would compare to your kappa, your curvature? And yeah, as a matter of fact, it does end up being your um, reciprocal. Yeah. So it turns out that the radius of the circle is uh, 1 over the curvature. So that's kind of interesting. So let's look at a parabola again. And then we saw that the radius for when t is equal to 0 at the point 0, 0, the kappa was equal to 2, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, from here, I can kind of eyeball it. And I, oh, that's pretty easy. I can draw my circle. And my circle will look like this. So you're saying, what I'm saying, or they're saying, somebody's saying, that the radius of the circle is going to be 1 half. And it looks like it would just fit right, right smack in the middle here. So I can say, oh, my center point of the circle must be here at, at, at what? At what? Zero comma what? A half, because I'm supposed to have a radius of one half here. 
right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, well, let's see. It, I hope this works. Let's uh, punch it in my graphing calculator program here and see if that is in fact the case. So I'll have my parabola and then I'll have my circle radius uh, one half and centered at zero. So that's x is minus or x is squared plus and then I have to do a y minus the shift, right? So that's a one half. And this is supposed to equal a one half squared since that's the radius. Oh, that looks nice. So that's your tangent circle. That was easy. Now, the next one was that other point that we had at 1. So when x is equal to 1, we saw that k was equal to 2 over 5 to the 3 halves power. So finding the radius would be good. The radius of the circle, whatever the circle is going to be, is going to be the reciprocal of uh, your curvature. But where's the center going to be? How can we get to the center? How, how can we get to that center? It has to be perpendicular to the what? So if we have a tangent vector over here, we need a line perpendicular to that tangent vector to get there. All right, well, let's put this problem on hold and let's try to answer that question. How can we find a vector that's perpendicular to the tangent vector? Okay? Because that's what we want to do. Finding a vector perpendicular to the tangent vector. Problem on hold. <laughs> Need vector perpendicular to tangent vector. I suppose I should have typed that because I don't know how many of you can read that. But you're getting used to my handwriting already, right? All right, let's uh, finding a normal vector. So <clears throat> let's go back to the idea of a graph. And we can go back to 3D in this case, but we can stick with 2 or 3D. We know that if we have r of t, the curve, we have uh, a velocity vector at some point, when, say when t is equal to t naught or something, then we have the velocity vector r prime evaluated at that t naught. Okay? So we're interested in, in uh, a vector more specifically pointing inward because when you take a normal vector, uh, when you when you look at a two-dimensional curve and you have a tangent vector, there's two possible normal vectors, right? And if you're in 3D, then it's even worse because now you have an infinite number of possible normal vectors to, to work with. And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to end up finding the vector that pulls inwards, which is uh, more or less, uh, in, in physics talk, more or less going to be going in not in the exact same direction as the acceleration, but generally the same 
area or same direction as the acceleration is going. So how are we going to do that? Well, it turns out that there's a little trick in, in uh, not, not really a trick. Tricks are for kids. But uh, the idea that we took a look at a unit tangent vector. Let's, let's go revisit that unit tangent vector because it seemed to help us determine our curvature. And let's see if it has more uh, ideas for us to work with. Recall the unit tangent vector, which is the, the magnitude, uh, which, is, which has magnitude 1. And with this unit tangent vector, we know that regardless of what it looks like or how complicated or how easy it looks like, uh, that we know that the magnitude of this is 1. Okay. Now, usually when you want to uh, create something that is perpendicular to this, you can just take the derivative of it. What's that mean, take the derivative of it? Well, it's hard to take the derivative of this because we don't have any formulas for taking derivatives of magnitudes. But we do have some formulas for taking derivatives of other things, right, at the very first, first page that we saw. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, use uh, a, a, a piece of information, a fact from the beginning when we start, first start talking about vectors. And uh, I'm going to square this on both sides, which might not seem like anything, but then let's see if anybody can pick up on this um, to see where we're going with this idea. So if I square both sides, <clears throat> I'm still going to have one on the right side, but now the other side is squared. So what what formula am I thinking about from the very beginning of, of vectors, I, I guess that was chapter 12 or something, uh, that might have something to do with a square of a magnitude. Does anybody remember? The dot, the dot product, right? It turns out that the square of a magnitude is the vector dotted with itself. So this it's just T dotted with T. Right? So this move over here comes from a fact that if you dot a vector with itself, you're going to get essentially the square of the magnitude. So now what do we want to do? Any ideas? What are we trying to do? We're trying to find something that's perpendicular to the tangent vector. We have a unit tangent vector here, which is tangent. and But we have one on the other side. So we want something perpendicular, so we want it to be 0 on the other side. No. Well, we want the dot product to equal to zero. Dot product of something, I don't know what. Calculus. <laughs> Let's calculus it. <laughs> What's that mean? What if we take the derivative of it? If we take the derivative of both sides, the derivative of the right-hand side is going to be zero. right? That's how you wipe it out. Now we just need to take the derivative of the dot product. Wait. How do we take the derivative of the dot product? Product rule. Remember this page that I snuck in at the very beginning? Product rule. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to DDT both sides. And then on the left-hand side, we're going to use the product rule. So derivative of the first times the second, except it's a dot product. 
plus the first times the derivative of the second is equal to, and most importantly, zero. Now, is the dot product commutative? Yeah, you can change the order. So we can change the order here, which means we can, these two are the same thing. We can add them. So we can skip this step, or I'll write this step. 2t dotted with t prime is equal to 0, and just knock out the 2. There you go. This is a velocity vector, a tangent vector, and what? We just found a normal. This vector here is perpendicular to the tangent vector. The derivative of the unit tangent is actually perpendicular to the unit tangent vector. That's kind of cool. Now, if all we really care about is the direction, and we go by what people say, you know, size doesn't matter. We could just make it into a unit vector, right? So, let's do that. And let's call it a special name. This is the unit normal vector. And that is your n. What's that equal to? That's equal to t prime, right? But t prime, you know, t itself was a unit vector, but when you take the derivative of that, that might, something might have happened. The, the, it might have changed magnitudes. So just to make sure that it's a unit vector, let's make it into a unit vector by doing what we normally do, to make things into a unit vector. And that's divide by its magnitude. So your normal vector, your unit normal vector, is going to be t prime divided by the magnitude of t prime. So now with that, we can get a direction to go from your point to get us to the middle of that tangent circle. Really? Well, can't you read? This is clear, isn't it? Unit, normal, vector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere. Okay, so we got a normal vector. Unit normal at that. While we're at it, if we're in three dimensions, we have these two vectors, a normal vector and uh, uh, the, tan the unit tangent and the unit normal. So if we're in three dimensions, usually we can just add another axis in there, right? <laughs> so imagine you're flying a quadcopter or something in space, and you're at some point in space, frozen in time, going through a particular path. And at some point in space, you want to try to observe as a quadcopter that's maybe taking ideas or taking pictures or trying to identify your surroundings. At that one point, one instant in time that you're at, you might be curious to see what's happening to the left, to the right, above, below, or in front of you. So as you do that and you want to report back to whoever's controlling you, you want to report back the distances from where you are. So in order to do that, it might be good to put yourself in a frame 
in some sort of frame where you have three axes that you're looking at. You're looking at the axis that's moving you forward. And you're looking at the axis, the second axis that's perpendicular to that, that tells you this is how you go left or right. So in three dimensions, might as well figure out how you're going to go up or down, right? So in 3D, maybe it might be good to try to figure out another axis. Whoa. Maybe I'll draw this a little bit. Maybe you can figure out a third vector from that point that's going to determine your up and down mo motion. So this is sometimes, well it's not sometimes, this is called the unit binormal. So the unit binormal is perpendicular, first of all it's a unit vector, second of all it's perpendicular to both your velocity, your, tan your unit tangent, and your unit normal. So how do you get a vector that's perpendicular to two other vectors? Cross them. So if you have your n and your t already, it turns out that finding your binormal is going to be really easy. You just cross them. Now when you take the cross product, remember that the magnitude of a cross product is equal to the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two vectors, right? So n and t n and t are perpendicular and have unit length. So what is the parallelogram spanned by n and t? I guess I should say t and n. It's the what? It's one. It's a square. It's a unit square. So the magnitude of the cross product is actually going to be 1. So it's already going to be a unit vector. So now the only th other thing to worry about is which way you're going to cross them. Is it n first or t or tn first? Because that's going to give you two different vectors. Turns out that the unit binormal is going to go with t first. That's the first vector that we got, the tangent vector. Cross it with the normal vector. And these are all functions of t, so we can think about it as functions of the parameter t. <coughs> That's your formula for the unit binormal. Okay? Is that good? So, of course, the easiest problem is the helix. We can work on the helix. Uh, or we could try to do something else. But this, this sets up a frame. Um, you know what? I think uh, <clears throat> I think our 3D plotter has a frame. So if you're into like animation and stuff like that, the, the idea of Frenet frames, oh, there's, there's the word, Frenet frames, the idea of these frames are going to be important because that's, you're going to be following these frames. 
So uh, to get to a frame, let's add a space curve. Now let's find it. I guess I should have looked for it before class, huh? See an add frame anywhere? TBN frame, TNB frame. What do you think the TBN stands for? TNB. <laughs> yeah. show looks like it's supposed to be here oh here show So if you follow this graph around, you see, can you see? You see a small frame over there that's made up of three mutually orthogonal, that means they're all perpendicular to each other, mutually orthogonal vectors. One being the tangent, one's a normal, and one's uh, perpendicular to both, called the binormal. So with, uh, with a helix, of course, it's easy to find this by hand. Otherwise, it gets a little bit more difficult, and uh, when, especially when you're finding it for a general value of t. This is being computed for every single value of t as we move along this curve. But uh, if, you get, if you get focused on a specific value of t, it gets a little bit easier because you get to put the t value in, and then you're dealing with numbers instead of functions. But that's the way you can get your frame. Now, if you look at the frame that they have here, show frame with all its features, you can just uh, view the frame itself without the features. And here, you're just looking at the frame. The other features that this particular program shows you are the looks like are the planes that are involved here. So let's see if we can get a nice frame where we can see everything. That one looks okay. This T T N B frame, by the way, is called a Fernet frame. That's Another name for it. Now it's harder to see. What happened? I thought it was easy to see. So the Fernet frame is a collection of these mutually orthogonal unit vectors, or orthonormal, I guess, is the way to call it in linear algebra. So you have your, your tangent vector, your normal vector, and your binormal vector. <coughs> and 
and you saw three planes that these things lie on. So those planes actually have special names. At least two of them I know have special names. I don't know about the other one. Um, but let's see how we're going to work with colors here. Let's do green. No, <laughs> that's going to be confusing. Um, so if you're if you're looking at this like you're a roller co you're riding on a roller coaster, there's a couple things that uh, that you can look at as part of the frame. One of them is the, your ground floor, your seat of your car, or something like that, right? That's uh, the the plane that contains T and N. Plane containing T and N. So in terms of you and the roller coaster and the car, it'll be the floor of the car. So there's a special name for this. It's called the osculating. Osculating. Osculating plane. That keeps your ground floor as you move along. So if, you're, if your curve twists and turns and your osculating plane might be going, you know, whatever it's going to go. It might go upside down depending on how you're moving along the curve. Depending on the, the direction that you're going and the acceleration, whichever way the acceleration is pulling you. So it's possible that you're going to go upside down, and that's okay. Um, and one other plane that I think the book talks about is the plane that contains N and B. So for that, in terms of you riding in a roller coaster, it would be like your back. It's like, you know, the back where you're sitting, the back of your seat where you're moving forward. So that contains the, the normal vector and the binormal vector. And that is perpendicular to the direction that you're going towards, right? So that's called a normal plane. And then the third one, I don't know what that's called. It must be called something since they gave names to everything. But <coughs> We're not going to get to that question that we left unanswered. Uh, if you want to look at an example of this, there's an example in the book that talks about this, uh, this thing. Um, so in three dimensions, in three dimensions, your osculating plane isn't just flat, right? It just it goes kind of goes all over the place. So in three dimensions, the idea of your tangent circle might be kind of weird. If you imagine a wire that's getting twisted somewhere as your curve, right? And you're flying along this, this wire as if you are either a drone or on a roller coaster or something like that. Then you look at tangent circles, circles that are tangent to this path. That tangent circle isn't going to be flat all the time. So that tangent circle has to be on one of these planes. All right, so just a comment about the tangent circle. In 3D, the tangent circle lies, lies, lays, lies, lies on the osculating plane.
And so sometimes this is known as, the ta we don't, they don't really call it the tangent circle. I call it the tangent circle, but I don't think anybody else does. So most people call it What do you think they call it? No? It's not on the normal plane. It's called an osculating circle. Because it's on, it's itself is on the osculating plane. Okay. All right, I think we have time to go back to that problem. Let's do that. So in terms of that parabola that's flat on the xy plane, we can find the, the unit tangent. We can find mm -hmm. the unit normal. And if you try to look for the binormal, it's just going to give you 0, 0, 1 because it's just going to go straight up, Okay, regardless of where you are. So that's not going to help us much. So let's go back to that problem and see if we can find that tangent circle at 1. I guess t or x equals 1. Let's put let's use let's go back to t. So we found, if you remember, the kappa was equal to 2 over 5 to the 3 halves power. So we know that the radius is going to be the reciprocal. So let's find the components that, we're, that, we're, that we need here. We can find the unit tangent. And more importantly, we'll find the, the normal, the unit normal. And then that normal is going to take us to the center of the circle. All right? So let's reconstruct our R of T. And then let's find our T and our N. So we need our derivative. And then this will help us find our, not our prime, but our just our t vector. So this is going to be divided by the magnitude, right? Is that right so far? And we can be specific. We can try to figure this out exactly uh, at 1 when t is equal to 1. But before we do that, let's find the normal. Or maybe we should do that first. Well, let's find the normal. What the heck. So for the normal, I need the numerator. I need to take the derivative of this. I guess before I do that, sorry. Let's take the derivative. Wait a minute, the derivative. How are we going to do the derivative? Is it constant? It's not a constant, though, right? But we have a scalar function times a vector. So there's two ways to deal with this. One, we can just distribute this in here, and then we'll just take, a, take the derivative of that vector. But I don't want to go through the first page again, but the first page of notes here had an f of t times a vector, u of t. Scalar multiplication follows the same rule as a product rule when you're taking derivatives. So derivative of the first, eh, you know, whatever. I don't want to do it. 
Wolfram, Wolfram, where are you? All right, I was kind of waiting for somebody to say the answer, but it's not going to happen, so I'll do it. So negative one half one plus two t quantity squared to the negative three halves power times the derivative of the inside, which is going to be four t. Eight t. Right? The derivative of the first times the second plus the first. I'm just going to put star there times the derivative of the second. And then I would add them. So suppose I can try to simplify this. You know, if anybody wants to put this on Wolfram, just tell me the answer. <laughs> I'd be happy to quit any time. Um, so I have a negative t on top divided by 1 plus 2t quantity squared to the 3 halves power. And I'm adding 0 from my second part. Now the middle term is the one that I need to combine. So I need to somehow combine this times this and then divide it by that. Oh, now I really don't want to do it. All right. After you get this, you have to find the magnitude of this so you can divide, right? Um, And then you'll have your normal vector. So once you get your normal vector, you put 1 in because that's the t value that we have. And then what you could do is that from there you can find, you can go to this vector and then you can scale this vector so that you get to the new point. You can scale this vector by the reciprocal of your curvature to get your radius. And then you would have your tangent vector or tangent circle. Okay? All right. So it's a little bit past time. Um, I have, I will post I will post last year's exam on on the on web access. It kind of looks like this. It is uh, my exams are usually more spacious, so you can do your work and show your work there. But since this is just a review, I took last year's exact exam. So if you have friends from last year, you can just look at their stuff. But I, last year's. No. So I think I had six problems last time. I'll probably have about the same amount of problems for your test. You'll have an hour and ten minutes to complete your exam. Uh, it'll, it'll. When I say six problems, they'll have multiple parts. So we have one more topic to cover, and that is the projectile. We kind of hinted on it when we first started talking about chapter thirteen. But the last problem will be either projectile or the Frenet frame, I'm not sure yet, uh, for your actual exam. And I'll give you more details about your actual exam next week. OK? Uh, after next week. I'm not going to put it up yet. OK? Well, I'd like. I'd like to think that it's going to be the same. <laughs> All right. On to Tom. No, thanks. Thank you, though. Here are the answers. But I'll post them after next week. But you should struggle through it first. Yeah, yeah.
I mean, it'd be nice to just look at the answers and then say, oh, I can, I could do this, and then when it comes time for you to do the test, and you're not. You'll have the answers before the test, yeah. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Okay, bye, Cameron. I think I got lost in that part.